Welcome to Renishaw's online seminar series. This presentation is on applying resonance Raman spectroscopy to redox biology research. I am Catherine Lau, Application Specialist at Renishaw Spectroscopy Products Division. We are joined today by Dr. James Armstrong from the University of Bristol in England. James will tell us about his research on stimulating oxygenation of stem cells in tissue engineering using artificial membrane binding proteins, which he recently published in Nature Communications. But firstly, I provide an introduction to heme proteins explain the principle of resonance Raman spectroscopy and the benefits of applying it to redox biology research, as well as examples of how it is applied. Heme proteins are proteins that contain a tetrapyral microcycle. Structures with a tetrapyral microcycle are termed porphyrins, and they have a planar structure. Porphyrins differ in the number and arrangement of their peripheral substituents. They can bind a single metal ion in its central hole by four nitrogen ion bonds. The overall number of nitrogen ion bonds in the structure is called the coordination number. Maximal coordination number for an ion ion is six, but you can also get mono, di, tri, tetra, and penta coordinates. A porphyrin provides four coordination in the planar geometry, and the amino acid from the polypeptide provides one coordination, leaving one coordination place vacant, an axial ligation site. Oxygen can bind to the vacant axial ligation site in a five coordinate polypeptide, creating an oxygenated heme. The heme ion itself has different oxidation states. It can be ferrous or ferric. The Fe2 plus ferrous form is its reduced form, and the Fe3 plus ferric form is its oxidized form. You can also get Fe4 plus ions, but they're less common. It also has different spin states. The spin state refers to how the valence electrons occupy the d orbitals. In the low spin states, all the electrons are paired. In a high spin state, some electrons are unpaired. The electron pairing affects the magnetic properties and the heme geometry. Through determining the spin state, the oxidation states can be deduced. Electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy, for example, can be used to determine the spin state. UV visible spectroscopy can be used to determine the oxidation states of heme. These methods, however, cannot be applied to heme in organelles, cells, or tissues in situ. The functions of heme proteins, such as myoglobin, cytochromes, and hemoglobin, rely on the reduction oxidation redox of the heme. The protein functions of heme protein include oxygen transport and storage, electron transport and scavenging of free radicals. They have very important roles in health regulation and diseases. To study the functionality of heme proteins, we need to be able to detect the presence and elucidate their heme oxidation state. Cytochromes, myoglobin, hemoglobin, and neoglobin are some of the naturally occurring heme proteins. They are very important for our health. Cytochromes B, C, and C1 are important members of the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. The electron transport chain is part of the oxidative phosphorylation pathway used by mitochondria to produce energy. Normally, cytochrome C is intact within the mitochondria, but during apoptosis, it is released into the cytosol. Myoglobin, hemoglobin, and neoglobin are oxygen carriers in muscular tissues, red blood cells, and the brain, respectively. Defects in myoglobin can affect muscle cell functions. Defective hemoglobin may be manifested in anemia. Resonance Raman spectroscopy is sensitive to the presence of heme groups and can reveal information on the oxidation state, spin state, and oxygenation of the heme. Resonance Raman spectroscopy is therefore ideal 
for studying redox dynamics and its effects on health regulation in diseases. The main advantage of using resonance Raman over other techniques is its applicability to heme proteins in different environments. In solution, in isolated mitochondria, within cells and tissues. To understand resonance Raman spectroscopy, let's first consider Raman spectroscopy. Molecules vibrate at certain frequencies. When light interacts with the molecule, most of the time it is scattered without an energy change, meaning the scattered light has the same wavelength as the incident photon. We call this elastic scattering. About one in a million times, light is scattered with a change in energy, meaning the scattered lights have different wavelengths from the incident photon. We call this inelastic scattering or Raman scattering. Because the change in energy is specific to the vibrational energy of the molecules, we can identify the materials present by measuring the change in energy between the incident photon and the inelastically scattered photons. By focusing light at a certain wavelength onto a sample using a microscope objective and measuring the wavelengths of the scattered photons, we can plot a Raman spectrum containing peaks co corresponding to the wavelengths. By mapping an area, meaning collect a spectrum per point in a defined area, we can generate false color images based on the information in the spectra. The images can tell us what molecules are present, where they are located, and how they interact with each other. There are many advantages of using Raman imaging. The Raman spectra reveal the complete chemical profile. Specific targeting is not required. Raman spectroscopy measures the intrinsic energy of, in the samples. Labeling is not needed. Labeling related artifacts can therefore be prevented by not needing to apply external labels. It is non-contact and non-destructive. The same sample can be analyzed with parallel techniques downstream to provide correlative data. There is minimal sample preparation. Water has minimal effect on the spectra. Raman can even be used on live cells and for in vivo applications. Last but not least, Raman imaging is one of the few techniques that can provide chemical and spatial information at the same time. We can use light of any particular wavelength to excite the samples in spontaneous Raman spectroscopy. Resonance conditions can be achieved when an excitation wavelength close in energy to the electronic transition of a compound is used. Resonance can lead to greatly enhanced intensities of Raman scattering up to a million times. Resonance Raman spectroscopy uses an excitation wavelength that would provide the resonance effect. The resonance enhancement enables compounds to be detected at low concentrations. Thus, short exposure time can be used to collect data and faster imaging can be achieved. Deep UV wavelengths at around 244 nanometer can be used for resonance Raman spectroscopy of proteins and nuclear acids. Visible wavelengths at around 488 to 532 nanometer can be used for resonance Raman spectroscopy of heme and pigments such as carotenoids and chlorophyll. Renishus in Veer can be used for resonance Raman spectroscopy. It is a research grade Raman microscope with a class one laser safety design. It could be configured with multiple laser wavelengths, high or standard confocal modes to suit different research purposes. The high speed encoded microscope stage moves with a 100 nanometer precision. Different accessories or measurement modes are available for different samples. For liquid, we have the macro sampling kit. For live cells, Invia can be coupled to an incubator for environmental control. For tissue sections, streamline imaging, a fast mapping method that uses a line geometry laser is particularly suitable. Let's look at some heme protein spectra in different oxidation states. The first two spectra are from cytochrome C and the bottom three spectra are from myoglobin. 
Each peak in the spectrum refers to a vibrational mode in the molecule. You can see that the peak positions differ between the two heme proteins and also between the oxidation states. The peaks at 750 wave number and 1185 wave number are sensitive to reduced cytochrome C, whereas the peak at 1640 wave number is sensitive to oxidized cytochrome C. The peak at 1585 wave number is present in both oxidized and reduced cytochrome C, but this is stronger when the cytochrome C is reduced. The peak positions shift in myoglobin depending on whether it's metamyoglobin, deoxygenated and oxygenated. For example, the peaks at 1585 and 1640 wave numbers in oxymyoglobin shift to lower wave numbers in deoxymyoglobin. By Raman imaging cells, we can show the different oxidation states in heme proteins in the cell. A study by Brother and colleagues published in PLOS One shows the cytochrome B and cytochrome C in different oxidation states in rod and round shaped cardiomyocytes. The rod shaped cardiomyocytes are known to be more efficient in energy production. Raman spectroscopy showed that the cytochrome C in the mitochondria in rod shaped cardiomyocytes were more reduced than those in the round cardiomyocytes. This in turn correlates with higher mitochondrial membrane potential in rod-shaped cardiomyocytes, as shown by rhodamine-123 staining. High intermembrane potential is known to correlate with high energy production efficiency. From the information, the authors were able to propose a correlation between the level of reduced cytochrome C and intermembrane potential, as well as energy, energy production efficiency. Red blood cells carry and deliver oxygen around the body. Here, hemoglobin Raman signals were collected from a red blood cell by streamline HR repeat imaging using 150 millisecond per spectrum exposure time. As resonance Raman provides strong Raman intensity, the collection can be as fast as five millisecond per spectrum. The spectra on the right show hemoglobin Raman spectra obtained from the red blood cell shown on the left. The peak at 1636 wave number is sensitive to oxyhemoglobin. The spectra indicate the red blood cell had a mixture of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin throughout, but the level of oxygenation varied across the cell. The 1636 wave number peak is lower in intensity in the blue spectrum, showing the heme in the blue regions was more deoxygenated. Resonance Raman imaging can also be applied to tissues. As mitochondrial dysfunction is linked to neurodegenerative diseases, such as Huntington's disease, the ability to detect cytochromes and their oxidation states in the brain is useful for research on neurodegenerative diseases. To demonstrate this ability, we imaged a part of the RET hippocampus, as shown by the white box. The V-shape in hippocampus is known to contain neurons, which are surrounded by glial cells and neurites. The Raman image generated by principal component analysis shows three populations, neurons, glial cells, and neurites. The fluorescence image of the adjacent section helped us verify the component's identity in the Raman image. In the fluorescence image, the cell bodies of the neurons were stained green using nt n antibody, the glial cells were stained red using antigafap antibody. In the Raman image, we can identify the green region as the neuron um, cell bodies and glial cells and neurites as red and yellow. The difference in the red and yellow domains are likely to reflect the different cell densities as can be seen in the fluorescence image. This verification with fluorescence imaging was only required to do once. The components in the Raman image can be explained by the chemical information in the corresponding PC loadings. Reduced cytochrome C was detected in both neuron cell bodies and glial cells, as shown by the reduced cytochrome C band at 748 wave number. However, 
There is a higher level of reduced cytochrome B in the glial cells, as shown by the peak at 1127 wave number in the PC loadings in red. There are other peaks attributed to proteins and lipids. The Raman spectra therefore present the cytochrome information in the tissue section, as well as other biomolecules, which may be useful for understanding the cell fitness. One can also compare the cytochrome levels between healthy brain and deceased brain to provide molecular information related to disease pathogenesis. Resonance Raman can even be applied to heme proteins in whole organ, such as the heart, as shown in this photo. Using the Renishaw micro sampling kit, it is possible to measure heme proteins in the rat heart, held upright and kept alive by perfusion, simulating an in vivo condition. In this study published in PLOS One, the authors detected cytochrome B, cytochrome C and myoglobin signals from the perfused heart. Their redox states and oxygenation were studied under normal and ischemic conditions. Stop flow ischemia induced an increase in reduced cytochrome C, as seen by the intensity of the 750 band in um, 2 and 3. The level of reduced cytochrome C decreased after perfusion began. The band at 1127 wave number indicates the reduced cytochrome B level. The band at 1640 wave number indicated the level of oxymyoglobin decreased during global ischemia, but it recovered after reperfusion began. In the paper, the authors stated that if ischemia caused damage to the electron transport chain in mitochondria, there would be an increase in the reduced cytochrome B to cytochrome C ratio. As the cytochrome profile went back to pre-ischemic values after reperfusion, the authors concluded that there was no measurable damage to complex 3 of the electron transport chain. Those were all the examples I wanted to give in this presentation. To summarize, heme proteins such as cytochrome, hemoglobin and myoglobin have important functions for the host's health. Redox dysregulation can lead to a variety of diseases. Thus, information related to heme protein functions such as the redox of heme is important for understanding health regulation and disease pathogenesis. Resonance Raman spectroscopy is the ideal tool for redox biology studies because it is highly sensitive to the presence of heme proteins and can reveal their oxidation state and spin state. It can be applied to heme protein in solution, in organelles, cells and tissues in situ, allowing information to be gained from an environment as close to physiological conditions as possible. Resonance Raman spectroscopy is a powerful technique for studying redox biology of heme proteins. The information on the heme proteins and the oxidation states can be used to better understand diseases associated with redox dysregulation. Renishas Invia is highly suitable for redox biology studies. It has a comprehensive range of imaging techniques to suit different samples. For example, Streamline HR repeat imaging enables fast mapping at millisecond per spectrum speed. Streamline imaging, which uses a line laser, is particularly useful for tissue imaging. The micro sampling kit can be used for measuring solutions in a vial or perfused organ. Lastly, live cells can be kept alive or stimulated by environmental changes by coupling INVIA with a live cell incubator. This is the end of the first part of the presentation. Thank you for listening. If you are interested to read more about heme protein and resonance Raman spectroscopy applied to redox biology research, I recommend these papers and websites. I'd like to thank Professor Olga Sosnotiva from Copenhagen University in Denmark for permitting me to use her publications as examples in this presentation. I'd also like to thank Dr. Ali Bianaman from the University of Bristol for providing the RET brain sections. I'd like to now pass it over to, to Dr. James Armstrong to tell us about his research. Over to you, James. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so my name is James. Uh, I'm going to tell you today about some work which I've been doing on priming stem cells and how Raman microscopy 
was used to really aid our understanding of this technology. So why would you want to uh, prime a stem cell? So stem cell research in the last uh, 10, 20 years has really kicked off. and uh, We're now at a stage where we can inject stem cells into the body and look to promote repair of tissue which has been diseased or damaged. Um, and Equally, we can use stem cells in the lab to grow our own tissue constructs, simple tissue constructs that can be implanted into the body or can be used as disease models for understanding how disease processes work. So how can we move this on to the next stage? How can we look towards targeting or stimulating local tissue repair? Or how can we engineer large or complex organs? So we think we can achieve this through functionalizing the stem cell membrane. So this is what we're calling stem cell priming. Um, we look to introduce new functional proteins to the stem cell to augment and enhance the therapeutic utility of the stem cell. So proteins, um, while they offer a range of different uh, biological functionality, they are actually not the ideal candidates for introducing to um, a stem cell membrane. This is because they exhibit a non-uniform heterogeneous uh, display of negatively charged, positively charged and neutral amino acids. And so this doesn't really facilitate any sort of interaction with a negatively charged and hydrophobic phospholipid membrane. So we look to address this by performing two surface modifications of the protein. So the first of these was a cationization reaction, which involved chemically modifying the negatively charged amino acids into positively charged residues. This created a protein which was highly positive and allowed us to introduce a corona of negatively charged polymer surfactant. So we hoped that this hydrophobic corona around the protein would facilitate an interaction with the hydrophobic stem cell membrane. So these protein surfactant conjugates could adopt two conformations. The first of these is a closed conformation where the more hydrophilic segment of the uh, polymer surfactant wraps up around the protein, and promotes aqueous solubility. We also have a more hydrophobic segment um, called the nonophenyl tail, which was used to anchor the protein into the stem cell membrane. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the technology uh, which we developed using the green fluorescent protein. So this is a this is a protein with intrinsic structural fluorescence. So is ideal as a probe for seeing whether these um, structural modifications affected the structure or function of the protein and visualizing the protein at the stem cell membrane. So using GFP, we managed to synthesize these conjugates in high yield and with the aforementioned aqueous solubility. And these modified proteins retain their structure and fluorescence, which are key components when you're looking to perform any sort of protein modification. A very simple half an hour uh, incubation of these protein surfactant and conjugates with the cells uh, labeled the cells for up to seven days in culture. And these labeled cells remain proliferative, viable and with unaffected differentiation capacity. By this, I mean the mesenchymal stem cells that we primed and modified um, would still be able to undergo chondrogenesis to form cartilage, osteogenesis to form bone, and adipogenesis to form um, fat. So while we have an excellent platform technology here for uh, delivering proteins to the stem cell membrane and the cells remaining active, uh, we wanted to address one of the grand challenges in uh, tissue engineering, and this is oxygen deprivation. So tissue engineering is a two component system. So we have stem cells immobilized onto a support material, such as a gel or a scaffold. Um, and this is used to um, produce new matrix components, which then replace the scaffold um, to produce a self-supporting tissue construct. If, however, the tissue construct is too large, you end up with a situation where the cells in the center are starved of oxygen. So the cells on the periphery uh, consume the oxygen before it can diffuse into the center of the scaffold. So we wanted to see whether we could address this issue 
using stem cell oxygenation using our cell priming technology so rather than using the green fluorescent protein we wanted to switch this out for myoglobin and see whether the myoglobin surfactant conjugate could be delivered to the cell and then provide a reservoir of oxygen during tissue engineering so this is a typical scenario of cartilage grown under normal conditions so this was with a five millimeter by six millimeter scaffold so this doesn't seem particularly large but this was enough uh, to create an issue where we've got central cell necrosis and tissue degradation at the center of the cartilage constructs when we used our myoglobin prime cells um, and grew tissue under exactly the same conditions um, we saw a great enhancement upon the extracellular matrix formation at the center of the tissue so this was this was a really nice result and this was repeatable we've shown it many times um, but we wanted to run another control here which was looking at apomyoglobin so apomyoglobin is myoglobin which is lacking the iron heme um, so it cannot bind oxygen here and when we primed ourselves with apomyoglobin surfactant conjugates we saw a return to this necrotic core so these results have told us quite a lot about our system so we know that myoglobin can enhance the distribution of tissue in cartilage constructs and that the heme is critical in um, performing this enhancement we carried out quite an extensive gene expression analysis um, where we looked at the down regulation of hypoxia genes in our myoglobin prime system so you can see these here in blue and you can see that over the first seven days the seven days that we expect the protein to be at the cell we can see significant down regulation compared to our control system so this tells us here that not only is the heme important um, we can see some effect of oxygenation upon the gene network uh, in the cells which are primed for the tissue engineering. But this doesn't completely tell the whole story. So there's still several unanswered questions. So the first of these is, does the myoglobin surfactant conjugate actually label the stem cells so we know that the gfp surfactant conjugates interact with the cells um, but gfp is intrinsically fluorescent whereas myoglobin is a non-fluorescent protein so we thought about tagging this with a, a tag such as ritz or fitz but the real issue here is that we by modifying the surface of the protein we can quite likely affect the cationization and conjugation processes and we can also affect how the final conjugate interacts with the stem cell so what we needed here was a non-invasive method for visualizing the myoglobin at the stem cell surface so the second question was if the protein does interact with the cell what oxidation state is the heme in so myoglobin can adopt a vast array of different oxidation states and it, these different oxidation states determine whether it can bind oxygen or not so this is actually a really key question and one we can answer uh, using simple confocal microscopy so luckily I, I was at a conference in America a few years ago and somebody put me in touch with um, Catherine Lau at Renishaw um, and they have developed a range of different microscopes which are perfectly suited for what we need to achieve. So using the Raman microscopes at Renishaw, we looked at our primed cells and we were looking here for Raman signal from the iron oxygen chemical bond. So these are some of our results. So these are cells which we've mapped uh, using a Raman microscope and the first one um, shows cells which have been labeled with uh, an apomyoglobin surfactant conjugate the key thing here is that we see only a single component so we see a background signal so this shows us that we're seeing a uniform chemical distribution of the different phospholipids and proteins at the cell 
When, however, we looked at this using uh, myoglobin primed cells, we saw a second component appear. So the first component, which is shown in green, is very similar to the uh, component seen for the apomyoglobin. But we have a second component here, which is myoglobin. So Raman microscopy allowed us to visualize the myoglobin conjugates at the cell using a non-invasive method. And it actually showed us a lot more about our system. Not only does the conjugate interact with the cell membrane, we see the distribution of the protein at the cell. So we can see clumps of protein appearing at the surface of the cell. So this corroborates what we've seen using the GFP system. Um, so we've seen a very similar pattern here appearing on confocal and uh, GFP labeled cells. So what we think we're seeing here is the protein accumulating into clathrin coated pits on the cell membrane. So Raman microscopy has given us evidence of not only whether the protein interacts, but how it rearranges on the surface once it's on the cell. And we very quickly identified um, a couple of peaks from this component, which we were used, we used to identify the oxidation state of myoglobin. And these two peaks were very characteristic of oxyferrous myoglobin, which ties in with the gene expression analysis and the results that we are seeing from the tissue engineering. So these peaks of 1585 and 1637 wave numbers um, were very indicative of this oxidation state. So ferric myoglobin and deoxyferrous myoglobin exhibit these two peaks at much lower energies and much lower Raman shift. So this gave us some real answers to the questions that we were trying to ask about how our system works. And it's really informed us and will allow us now to develop this technology towards different tissue types and different proteins. So this suggests to us that even though we're introducing myoglobin in an oxidized state, so when you buy it in a jar, it's in an oxidized metmyoglobin state, uh, we're ending up with oxygenated ferrous myoglobin. So this suggests that there must be some cellular uh, redox processes going on to convert ferric myoglobin into ferrous myoglobin, lose the water molecule and provide a binding site for oxygen. This is just a working theory, but we think we're getting a redox cycle involving NADH, uh, reductase proteins and cytochrome B5. Uh, but the important thing here is that we've got myoglobin in an oxygenated state as shown by Raman microscopy and then this can have a beneficial effect upon tissue during tissue engineering. So just in conclusion, uh, we've developed a technology here for delivering proteins to the cell membrane um, using surfactant bioconjugation. So this is a very versatile technology. We can use we can use it to deliver an array of different proteins to all different sorts of cells. However, we've used this technology for priming stem cells for cartilage engineering. So using a myoglobin surfactant bioconjugate, we've improved the tissue distribution in large tissue constructs. And these two conclusions you can read about a bit more in the Nature Communications paper, which myself and Catherine published earlier this year. And the citation is at the bottom of this page. Finally, we have used Raman microscopy to determine whether the myoglobin is interacting with the cells, the distribution of myoglobin on the cell surface, and critically for us, the oxidation state exists at the cell. So these answers to the questions that we've been asking have really helped us inform this study and will develop this technology towards different tissue types and different proteins. So I'd just like to say thank you to everyone involved in the project, in particular, Dr. Adam Perryman and Professor Anthony Hollander, who have been supervising me during this work, and also to Dr. Catherine Lau at Renishaw for all her help with all the Raman microscopy that we performed over the last year. Thank you very much. Thank you, James, and thank you all for listening. If you've got any questions, please feel free to email me or James 
Our email addresses are on the webpage. If you enjoy the webinar and you would like to watch the future ones, please subscribe to our mailing list. Thank you and goodbye.